Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the relatively recently released Star Dynasties. It was first out in early access earlier this year, and it has since seen many updates on the lead-up to its version 1.0 release in September, and then with free updates as recently as just a few weeks ago. When I first played it in early access, I enjoyed the idea, but felt the game had a long way to go. It was in early access after all, but after watching Dune a couple times in theaters, I felt the itch to give Star Dynasties another try. Now don't worry, there won't be any movie spoilers in this video, but I wanted a grand space opera that was about families feuding over territorial claims. I wanted that Crusader King style drama except in a sci-fi setting at a galactic scale, and that was the promise of Star Dynasties after all. And so, after spending some more time with Star Dynasties, I wanted to do a deeper dive on it on the channel, on what it does well, on what it can stand to improve, and why I think you may be interested in checking out this game that sort of slipped under everyone's radar. The setting. Star Dynasties is set in the distant future. Shortly after humanity took its first steps into space colonization, a catastrophe brought about the destruction of planet Earth, plunging the galaxy into a new dark age. Much of the more advanced Earth tech, while still strewn about in space, has lost its value. The distant and disparate colonies having lost an understanding of how it all works over time as they fought desperately just to survive without a centralized authority. Centuries passed, and the remote colonies that survived began to establish simple feudal societies, relying still on technology they barely understood and couldn't replicate, but could still occasionally repair and harness for various purposes. With limited resources, including limited access to said technology, fighting between the various colonies was inevitable, and over time, they pledged allegiance to elite families, with barons and dukes and larger collectives working together to carve out their own space in the galaxy. Their own space in space, if you will. This is the setting in which you take control, leading your own dynasty across multiple generations in the hopes of establishing a powerful empire. You'll be managing vassals, dealing with familial relations, navigating political drama, and participating in all manner of skullduggery to keep your own family in power while keeping others in check. Much of the galaxy in each playthrough begins unexplored, and unlike other games set in space like this, you won't find yourself colonizing new planets. That technology has long been lost, and instead, you'll need to wrench control of planets that have already been colonized one way or another. The pen and the sword are both powerful tools here. Different planets have different strengths and weaknesses. While some might be economically viable, others might have access to rare technology or might be better placed strategically, controlling choke points for when war inevitably breaks out. The technological limitations in the world of Star Dynasty doesn't just set the stage, though. It plays into a host of gameplay mechanics. As I stated earlier, you'll never find yourself actually colonizing entirely new planets, but beyond that, planets have pre-existing structures that need to be repaired rather than empty building slots that need filling. Rather than making decisions on what to build at each planet, you will plan your expansions and expenses based on which buildings and respective benefits you want to have access to sooner. Between this and system traits like the occasional megastructure or asteroid field, your strategy for conquest and defense will be determined by the galaxy itself. Beyond that, the limited availability of resources introduces a conversation about scarcity and its effects. While you won't be looking to acquire food and industry and science in a traditional sense, you will have to behave in accordance to expectations of the setting. As we'll talk in just a moment, characters and family are essential to your success, but with this aforementioned scarcity of resources, people are expected to limit the size of their family, and this means a limit to your strength that you don't have to pay attention to but might want to consider lest people see you as using more than your lot and start to look upon you unfavorably. Every game starts with character and house generation, picking traits that will have an impact throughout the life of your first character, and in some cases, throughout the entire game. But when you hit play, the galaxy itself is randomly generated. Your family might be led by a duke standing on their own, or you might be at the head of a federation of states, or you might be vassal to an Archon rather than an independent entity. From whichever beginnings you get, you'll have to find a way to gain glory for your family. The Character Focus Star Dynasties is built around the characters of the galaxy, who they are, what makes them tick, and how they get along, or more often, don't. 
Star Dynasties is much like Crusader Kings in how it focuses on the interactions between characters as the driving force of the evolving narrative, and while you can be the instigator for any given series of events, the AI will engage you just as well, inviting you to weddings and feasts and asking for your assistance in times of war and peace alike. Your traits and the traits of those you're interacting with all have different degrees of relevance depending on the circumstances you find yourself in, and the consequences can be quite varied. Your drunkard self flirting with your sister-in-law is one thing, but actively and loudly making a move on her in the middle of a feast is certainly a worse look, especially if it comes after you've been stumbling around and making outrageous toasts. Similarly, being a capable fighter and winning tournaments will earn you some glory, which you can use to your advantage as people look upon you more favorably. There are a huge variety of events and each one is a pleasant surprise when it first pops up. Some will give you options, others will simply play out based on existing circumstances like your traits, but they'll all be entertaining and impactful in some way or another. As for the other characters in the story apart from yourself, they have their own traits, ambitions, desires, and actions too. They'll want favors, you'll want favors, and whenever something needs doing, you'll need to assign people to the task at hand, so making sure the most capable people under your wing like you is an important part of any playthrough. And what matters more than just your own lifetime, of course, is when you eventually die and your you know, successor takes over, you have to try and make sure that people like them just as much as they liked you so that it doesn't all fall apart when you pass away. Much like Crusader Kings, you don't just control a single character in this game, but instead you control that dynasty's entire line. Now, as I was saying, it's very important to make sure people are satisfied with you, but it's also important to make sure they're satisfied with their circumstances. Their opinion of you and their current mood, alongside their skills and stats, determine how well they'll perform any task you assign them to, including duties on your council. So, You'll spend time making sure your vassals and advisors and generals alike are kept happy and feel good about you. Random events will give you options that can impact these things, and you'll find yourself balancing these relations and moods constantly. All it takes is an inopportune turn of events and an opportunist neighbor for one of your vassals to be convinced to turn coat, and the next thing you know, a system under your control has joined another federation, and neighboring systems are second-guessing your authority too. This intricate game of egos can get quite compelling as illicit affairs, the dishonor of divorce, espionage, family, and secrets of all kinds start to evolve. There's no feeling quite like having kin on the other side of a war who refuses to support their liege against you, giving you an advantage as a result of countless turns worth of improved relations and good treatment. This is the heart of Star Dynasties. This is what Star Dynasties does so well. It's all about politics intrigue, and honor. You'll be planning assassinations that put people who like you in positions of power across the galaxy while deposing those who might stand against you within your own realm, replacing them perhaps with family members that love you. And while some of these actions will take place within your own realm, yes, others will involve systems and families well beyond your direct control as you try to spread your influence in ways beyond the expansion of your borders. Asking your brother-in-law to join you in an endeavor when they lead a different realm is much more likely to gain you results than asking some stranger in charge when you have no relation to them. Well, that's assuming you get along with your brother-in-law and he's not got plans against you in the first place. Like I said earlier, characters have their own motivations and you never know when one's going to stab you in the back. You'll forge some alliances that last generations and some that last the duration of a single conflict. You'll arrange marriages, push claims, and make demands of other nobles above, at, and beneath your level as needed. As described earlier, some of your actions will draw the ire of others while others will appeal to them. There are no universal goods and evils though as everybody's opinion will color how they feel about any given action and it's up to you to figure out which opinions are the most important politically, socially, economically, and militarily as well. You can also use people's opinions of each other as tools against them, seeking out and revealing secrets or appealing to people's sense of honor when needed. Crime and punishment are a key factor in Star Dynasties, and honor is a major driving force of decision making. Claims on a system can be fabricated if they don't already exist, and while you can declare war without claims, 
You can bet people won't be happy about it, seeing your conquest as criminal. But honor and crime and punishment go beyond claims and wars. Betraying your liege, asking somebody to betray theirs, participating in illicit affairs, or performing actions that are socially unacceptable will all affect your honor, and they might affect the honor of others too. At times, you'll find yourself asked to make right your wrongdoings, and at other times, you'll be tasked with making criminals pay for their crimes. For example, a baron under your control might have betrayed a former master to join you, and that former master might demand that you punish them for their betrayal. Others who were tangentially affected might do the same, and you might feel a bit more beholden to them. You can ignore them, upsetting them, or you can comply in any way that balances the crime out. In other cases, a vassal of yours might have been the victim of a crime, and they might ask you to avenge them and make a push for justice on their behalf. The criminal in question might be another vassal of yours, or they might serve another realm entirely, making for potential trouble as you might need to take it up to the political leader in a foreign realm, something that can work in your favor, but is just as likely to instigate a war or leave you looking like a fool. And occasionally, you'll be the criminal, and people will be asked to extract a fine from you, your willingness to cooperate becoming a key factor in how things play out. All this character-driven intrigue and politicking is where those Dune vibes really come through. Plotting against people who have wronged you or your vassals, fending off similar plots against yourself, and using methods both underhanded and not as means to expand your political influence across the galaxy. You'll watch empires fall apart as rebellions rise up, sometimes instigated by your own cunning hand, and you'll seek the opportunity to swoop in as a savior or as a conqueror looking to pick up the divided houses. You'll see territories trade hands to avoid entire wars, and at times you'll see families abandon their lieges to seek protection from another in the face of an imminent threat. War and Combat War and combat are an interesting beast in Star Dynasties. There are no great big battles, there's little visual drama, and in fact, even the production of ships is obfuscated in some ways. I don't know if it's for everybody, and I thought it was a little clunky at first myself, but as it became more familiar, the role-playing aspects of it and the storytelling angle made it quite a bit more interesting than I'd first realized. First, let's talk about how you get to the fighting. We've already touched on the concept of claims and casus belli, and how you can declare wars that are more or less justifiable. But before you declare such a war, you'll want to make sure your navy is strong enough to fight it. Like I said, the production of ships is rather obfuscated. You won't select planets and tell them to build one of the three types of ships waiting a set number of turns before they become available. No, 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 no. Each planet is able to sustain and support a certain number of ships of each type. This is determined by your realm's military capabilities, which in turn is determined by your own stats, the stats of your counselor in charge of that specific set of duties, and whether you've been able to build certain structures that bolster these numbers or not. On top of that, the planet's own wealth determines how many ships it can feasibly sustain, and while there are a variety of buildings that bolster wealth, some will also bolster fleet production capabilities in additional ways. You'll want to repair these buildings as soon as possible, especially where you feel there might be war, since this is only the first step to building ships, having the capacity to sustain them. After that, things become a bit more passive, if you so choose. Each planet will work towards that limit of sustainable ships over time. If the current number is below the limit, you'll see the number of ships grow per turn, and if the current number is above the limit, you'll see the number of ships drop per turn. This reflects ships going into disrepair or otherwise being unusable. You can assign characters to bolster this ship production rate or change the composition of the local fleets. Sometimes you'll want more of a certain type of ship over another, and people and buildings alike can help in performing these tasks. It'll still take a fair bit of time to get to full strength, so you'll need to keep that in mind. It applies to the enemy just as much as it applies to you. When the time to fight finally comes, you can send characters over to plan attacks on the various planets, and over a handful of turns, these plans will buff your fleet strength, though there's always a risk that your planning gets found out. It's not necessary to plan an attack, but it can make a major difference against a superior enemy. When the time for an assault actually comes, you'll once more see a very different take. 
Just because ships are available in your realm doesn't mean they're available for every engagement. They might be too far to reach the site of battle, or they might belong to a character who's not willing to join your cause. Either way, you have to actively call people to battle, and as you do so, you risk having your attack discovered. Until your attack is discovered, you can call people to join until you run out of options, but once your attack is discovered, you'll go back and forth with your target, calling people to arms. This means the longer your attack goes undiscovered as you call people, the more of an advantage you're likely to have. Even if your attack doesn't get discovered as you call people, the defender will have a chance to call some people to battle just before you trigger your assault, but they will be significantly hampered as they're taken by surprise. Unless planets directly under your control are too far away, you can always join with your own fleets. Your vassals are more likely to answer the call to battle, and even if they don't have ships of their own, them joining you will allow allies and other vassals to pass through their space. Only those who can find a path to the site of battle can even be called, so keep that in mind as you pick targets. Vassals of vassals are also likely to join if their own liege has joined, and if you've played your cards right, everybody under you should be willing to dive in. At times, as mentioned earlier, people will refuse to join the party that calls them for whatever reason, and having such pawns on the opposite side of a war can be very handy. When the assault begins, you go back and forth for a few rounds, choosing tactics that are available based on the character in charge of the battle, and dice rolls determine damage output for each side. One side is declared the victor, and the consequences unfold. As you can see, battle itself is rather short and in some ways a little uninvolved perhaps, but the lead up to battle is a very different kind of experience, starting technically from well before war is even declared as you try to ensure the support of your vassals and others in your federation if that's the case. Again, when I first played Star Dynasties, the battles, the wars, they didn't seem very fulfilling and they felt rather hollow. And then I realized that the game isn't about those battles, it isn't about those wars, it is about the relationships you build on the lead up to those battles, and how those relationships sort of pay dividends or don't. Again, Star Dynasties might not be for everybody. It certainly has somewhat clunky visuals, and again, it's not really about the flash and spectacle as you try to conquer enough territories to win the game. It's more about political drama and intrigue. It's a space opera, and while that classification is not opposed to spectacle, there's something about a game that focuses on non-wartime aspects, even in wartime, and that just appeals to me in a special sort of way. Mod support can add tons of nifty extras, like new events that keep things interesting, and the overall vibe of the game is, as I was saying earlier, akin to how I felt watching Dune. Yes, there is action, of course there is, but the driving force of the movie isn't to take you from battle scene to battle scene, but instead to take you from character interaction to character interaction. It tells you a story about family, trust, and the politics of a galaxy-spanning realm, and that's what Star Dynasties seems to pursue. You're less bothered about getting plus two to armor piercing on your shiny new destroyers, and you're more concerned about that seed you planted many turns ago that'll hopefully spark a rebellion in your neighbor's massive realm, splitting them into countless tiny pieces that are willing to join you or will be more easily conquered by you. You're worried about your uncle getting a little too ambitious, being unhappy with the barony you've given him, betraying you, and joining another federation in an act of defiance. If you're into role-playing, if you're into grand tales of conquest and court drama, and if you've got an active imagination, and enjoy emergent gameplay, then Star Dynasties might be well worth your attention. I've been pleasantly surprised with my time with it, especially after how I felt at the end of Early Access, and I feel as though it's a bit of a shame that it just slipped under everybody's radar. The devs continue to put out updates to improve systems, and if they keep adding more events and story beats, the game will continue to get better and better. If you've played Star Dynasties or have thoughts of your own otherwise, leave them in the comments down below. I'd love to know how other people feel about the game that I personally have turned around on and am quite enjoying now. Otherwise, as always, don't hesitate to subscribe to this channel for more strategy gaming news, previews, reviews, let's plays, and more. And also, as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.